start our tour around the fish dock, we're here outside the port office, which to most people they refer to as the dock offices. Grimsby, as a port, there's references back to 1165. Oh really? Yes, oh, when wow. Henry II granted permission for the city of Lincoln to raise tolls against men from Norway who used Grimsby as a trading centre. The port, prior to 1796, when the Grimsby Haven Act was passed, was run by the corporation. But it, over a number of years and decades, it silted quite badly. Trade had declined, so it was in a very, very poor state. Just prior to 1796, a, a group of landowners got together, including Lord Yarborough and George Tennyson. And they decided that they would try and do something and raise some money through selling shares. And the Act, the 1796 Act, mm. gave them the permission and also formed the Grimsby Haven Company. Now that continued right up to the coming of the railways, which was in the 1850s. Mm. And the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway Company took over thereafter. It was then that there was substantial capital investment, starting with the Royal Dock. Okay. We, right? So it's the railways that it kind was of the railway. got it all started. That's right. And we can see in front of us that there's a commemorative statue of Prince Albert. Yep. Now, Prince Albert came in 1849 to lay the foundation stone. So when Prince Albert came, he laid the foundation stone and that was the start of the huge investment in Grimsby. We talk about the name. The name didn't come about until 1854 when Queen Victoria came and oh. she officially opened the port. So that brings the commercial dock together at that particular point. Mm. Then they moved over and looked at the fish dock. They needed somewhere to accommodate fishing vessels. So by 1857, the first fish dock became operational in the town. Wow, okay. But the investment didn't stop there. They came and expanded that and built number two fish dock, the first part of it. Mm. Then they moved back to the commercial dock again and built the union dock between the South Arm of Alexandra Dock and the Royal Dock. So they've got a link then between the two different mm. dock structures. And then that starts to bring together the whole of the dock structure in the 1800s for Grimsby. Yeah, so it was all set, ready to go. That's right. <laughs> like we're ready, set to go and have a walk around the fish docks. We're now at the end of Warncliffe Road. This part is really the oldest part of the fish dock right. because Warncliffe Road faced the fish market. Vessels used to come in through the lock and they used to berth at a pontoon, which was T-shaped, that went out into the dock itself. Right, right. okay. Now this is 1856, 57. Mm. It became operational in 1857. By 1860, there wasn't sufficient room for all the vessels. Mm. And the T-shaped um, uh, jetty and mm. pontoon was removed to create greater space. Yep. By the 1870s, they were looking for more space. By the mid-1870s, they were looking at building number two fish dock. Which, wow. And behind us, there's yep. the cutting mm. that goes from number one fish, or what became number one fish dock, into number two fish dock. But all this area is the, the, the sort of crux of the fishing industry within mm. Grimsby. And when you look down Warncliffe Road, you can see the original rail lines, because when they demolished the T-shaped pontoon, they built a wharf that extended from where we're standing now mm. 
in the direction of the dock tower. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. Yep. And behind it, they put the rail lines in. Right. Now, okay. there are photographs that show that there were three lines of wagons next to each other. Mm. And when they were taking the fish from the market, from the wharf, they put it on barrows and on a plank, planks of wood from one rail wagon to another rail wagon to another oh, rail wow. wagon going across. And that was the Barrow Boys that were doing the, well, that? Yes, the Barrow, but the Barrow Boys also brought the fish from the areas where they used to auction it up to the processing oh, areas, you okay. see. So, so, so you've heard of the Barrow Boys, but I wasn't sure what they were barrowing from where and to. Yeah. So. Well, oh, what wow. they did, they, uh, there's um, a very good photograph of the West Market where the two ramps come down just mm. opposite Stuart Worthley Street. Right. Um, it shows that there was a one-way uh, one system. Empty barrows would come down the ramps one way and go up, and full barrows would go like that. <laughs> and the Barrow Boys, that's where you started on the fish dock. Right. That was sort of... So that was your first job. That's yep. right. And when you occupied that job for so long, you would progress and you'd go into filleting and then buyers and it, it, there was okay. a process so you worked your way up that's right yeah. so there was a hierarchy within the, the industry mm. the wharf when it was constructed originally was just single story mm. now in the 1920s they decided that they would replace that and build put a, a two-story concrete building in and just in front of us is the area where that used to be. But on the, the ground floor was a processing area known mm -hmm. as stands. Right. And the fish merchants would actually have their own area where they would process the fish. Upstairs, there were offices and lofts. Oh, okay. So therefore, they had like their business side and, and their admin side Yep. completely separate from the fish processing. Well, that's like a lot of the buildings as well, because on the ground floor, um, they were used for processing, and there's a completely separate door that takes you up to the first that's floor right. of the offices. The only part of the fish market that exists, as I've just been describing to you, mm. is the West Market. Right. So that is still there. But yes, it was very interesting when there was the, the stands and the offices and lofts, Mm. Because what you could do, you could go up the spiral staircase and lean over the balcony and watch them filleting the fish yep. below you. But unfortunately, all that ceased in around about the, the mid-90s when the EU brought in the health and hygiene regulations. Right. And they decided that the only thing to preserve and, and keep Grimsby as a a processing centre, a, a marketing centre, fish marketing centre, was to demolish the um, fish market along Warncliffe Road and build and construct the building that's there today. Right, okay, so and that's the fish market that's, that's in front of us. That's right. Yeah. A few years ago, when I was doing some research, I spoke to Martin Boyers of the uh, fish market, mm -hmm. and he said at that particular time, a roughly a million pounds worth of fish was sold over the market here per week. Wow. So that's 52 million pounds of revenue that goes through yep. that market in a year. Wow. Building 89, as it's now known, uh, which was Fred's Fish until recently, that building was constructed by Arthur and Robert Osborne, trawler owners, in around about 1856. And you may have heard of this person, Albert Osborne, was related to Arthur and Robert, who built the building. He was a soldier turned spy, working for the Soviet Union, and it was Albert Osborne who, in November 1963, made the call to the Cambridge News to alert them to a potential story in America, which was the shooting of JFK. It could be that that phone call was made from Building 89, uh, he'd just been away to America and come back and was staying with an uncle who we think was the person still running the offices there. There's actually a little room on the first floor that looks like it's potentially 
a telephone room that he may have made that call from. No evidence at all, but it might have happened. Now we're down Henderson Street, this is a really good example of the types of buildings that were constructed and how the construction took place. Mm. There were individual buildings that were being constructed one after the other um, and we can see by the joins of them. And I think another interesting point is the building that's in front of us. Yes. In as much as that it's in two halves but rather than being t two buildings together, they're sort of elong, you know, back to back. Oh, it's a back okay. to, you see what yes, I'm saying? Yeah. And if you look in the corner, you can see the fireplaces. So I was wondering, because the front of the building faced the, the fish market, perhaps the people who had that built were more affluent than yeah. those that uh, constructed it in Henderson Street, because of course it's at the back of the original building yes, and seems yeah. completely divorced from that. Mm. No, I don't know what That's, your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, that could be true because the front of the building would have been earlier anyway. Yes. Um, Warncliffe Road was the first the first bit to be built, yes. wasn't it? So but you'd have Warncliffe Road first, which faced the market and yep. faced the original pontoon. Yeah. And then they would start to expand by coming you know, south, moving mm. south, away from the market. Yep. If you were a fish merchant up here, you'd want to be right next to the fish market, wouldn't you? That's so right. you'd want to be on Warncliffe Road. Yes. Yeah. But if you can't afford that, mm. you'd have to then look at places like the next Hed best thing. That's right, yeah. Henderson Street. It's the area that some people refer to as the Casbah. Other people refer to it as the square. Now I've known it since the mid-1970s as the Casbah. It's an area that has four streets. To my right, the side bottom street, where we're stood at the moment, is Brown Street. Behind me is Surtee Street, and to my extreme right is Smith Street. Apparently, it was like an enclosed area, something like an Arabian Casbah or at least that's how some people saw it. In the 1970s, mid 1970s, all the buildings in the middle had been demolished and the area became a car park. As you can see, when you look round here, some of the buildings are in use. Some of them need renovation. One of the buildings that's been renovated at this particular time is the Peterson building, which is to my left. We've got some funding from National Lottery Heritage Fund and Architectural uh, Heritage Fund as well. The listed smokehouse um, is going to be repaired and hopefully brought back into use as a smokehouse. We've got a number of smokers who are interested in taking it on. Actually, there's a building opposite as well that forms part of the project and that's going to be repaired and brought back into use for offices. Um, so it's quite an exciting time actually because we should be up here with builders in kind of four or five months time hopefully. So, um, so I'm running a grant scheme which people can apply to for repair grants to, to do up the buildings if you want to come up here. There's two or three buildings up here. Um, a couple of them have recently been awarded planning permission. So there's planning permission for TC's club which is to my left. That was to be converted to an architect's studio. Now we're on Fish Dot Road, um, which was the main arterial route down to the fish market. Yep, so like uh, the main high street really. That's right, yep. it was. You know, people coming down to the fish docks had to travel down Fish Dot Road. Mm. And it's nice to be in the doorway of an old established building, Tom Taylor. Mm. And the building itself is now Grade 2 listed, so it, yep. that's nice. It adds to the history of the port and retains the history. Now, the building that used to be on the other side of the road, which is in front of us, was that for the Great Grimsby Coast Holt and Tanning Company, okay. originally starting by handling coal for the trawlers, 
salt for the preservation of the fish, and tanning for the sales of the smacks. They abbreviated it down to Co Salt. Um, unfortunately, the building's gone. Uh, it was a huge building, mm. and they did uh, net making in there as well, oh, as well wow. as the Chandlery, which was mm. on the ground floor. Yeah, and that was all on this side. That's right. It's my, it used to be right off where we're standing now. Mm. And you may have noticed as we walked along Fish Dot Road, there's various uh, premises that's named after boys. But there's Paul and mm. there's Timothy along here. Yep. And they are three of the sons of Terry Chapman. Oh, right? okay. And right. then he had another son, Kevin. Yep. So those four were used to name the premises that he was occupying oh, wow. and his sons occupied here. Yeah. Um, so that's quite interesting, and and that's not so long ago, you know, within the last thirty, forty years. Yeah. You know. And Terry Chapman, of course, he's TC's pub on the corner. That's so, right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we've got TC's pub. That was quite a place where you know people could come and they could uh, you know have parties, and and uh, there was an entertainment area above as well as the pub below. Mm. where the fish merchants used to um, frequent during the lunch times in downtown. Oh, wow. So, yes. So this building has been taken on by Creative Start, a community interest company. Um, one of the first new tenants up here in a while um, and with the, the aim of repairing this historic building and reusing it as their headquarters. So creative start work with people in recovery. It's been so successful here, it's fabulous. And in fact, they're running out of space for all of the things that they're making. So they're looking at maybe expanding into another building because they need the storage space. So just opposite creative start is Alfred Enderby Smokehouse, um, who smoke in traditional Grimsby smoked fish uh, using the traditional method that can only be used here. They supply smoked salmon, smoked haddock, all over the world, um, largely in the UK, to chefs such as Marco Pierre White, but also um, to local people as well. So you can get fish delivered. The smokehouse itself is one of the oldest here on the Casbah. It's a grade two listed building, one of seven listed smokehouses. Um, yeah, and continuing to flourish. It is exciting. It's been a couple of years of planning and organising and getting everything in place but yeah over the next 12 to 18 months there should be quite a lot happening up here actually so yeah next year should be a really exciting heritage open days. Mm -hmm.